Hello group, I'm Dr. Brian Holsey and I wanted to uh, give a shout out to uh, my good friend Rob Kuhn here. Um, he asked on a post for a video on explaining HPA access a little bit more. So I appreciate all Rob's work and uh, I, I love this, the energy of the board. And uh, I want to uh, give him a little video on uh, HPA access here. Um, I want to share this with all you guys. Again, feedback is welcome. Let me know if uh, there's any questions on this. Um, we're going to go through this pretty quickly. I'll review it a couple times, but I want to make sure we're set on the HPA axis here. And this can be applied to the HPT axis or the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis, the HP gonad axis. Uh, so the, the idea is the same. So the, the hypothalamus re produces releasing factors or releasing hormones. These releasing hormones now act on the pituitary to uh, cause the pituitary to secrete other hormones. Now these other hormones, TSH, LH, FSH, ACTH, so uh, growth hormone, and these all are produced by the anterior pituitary. Posterior pituitary secretes a couple things, vasopressin and oxytocin, but we're going to focus more so on the anterior pituitary and the HPA axis. Again, this could be applied to HPT, HPT, HP gonad, but it has influence. The, the main one is the HPA axis here, and that can influence all of our other axes. So the HPA axis, again, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So the hypothalamus lies deep in through the brain, so it's hypo or below the thalamus, so that's our structure right here. This is a medial cross-section of the brain. Cortex up here, the corpus callosum, cerebellum, and then this blue guy right here is our hypothalamus. Right up there. So that the main the first step that has to happen here is the hypothalamus produces corticotrophic releasing hormone, or CRH. CRH now travels down this infundibular stock to talk to the pituitary. What happens in the pituitary? The pituitary is stimulated to secrete ACTH, or adrenocorticotrophic releasing hormone. So from the pituitary, now we have ACTH, and we're going to get stimulation of the adrenal glands. So we get stimulation of the adrenal glands. We go here to review our anatomy. Adrenal glands are small glands that sit on top of the kidney, and they do they have an embryologic origin similar to that of neural tissue. So they, that's some of the reason that they're part of this neural axis. So we stimulate production of cortisol. And when is cortisol being produced? So any time of stress. So cortisol is increased with stress. The biggest stressor on the body is blood sugar dysregulation. So that's a key part of getting our patients to eat small meals frequently throughout the day and to, to make sure we're getting adequate protein and fat. So that's going to decrease the stress response. Other stressors, environmental, chemical, emotional, uh, physical, so all these things play into it. So cortisol is now going to act on the hippocampus. This is a small area, again, deep in through the temporal lobe. And it's right next to the pituitary and hypothalamus. At the front of the hippocampus is the amygdala, or a behavioral, emotional center, especially uh, tied into uh, long-term issues such as PTSD, panic attacks, anxiety. So again, it's a midline structure, so we need to stimulate midline structures to, to get that to function. The hippocampus, though, too much cortisol is going to blow out that hippocampus. The hippocampus is very important for uh, short-term memory as well as it's in our temporal lobe, so it, temporal lobe is responsible for smell and sound. If we start losing our sense of smell, that's, gonna, that's an indicator that we have early hippocampal degeneration. So we have that degeneration via 
NMDA or N-methyl D-aspartate receptor activation at, at each neuron there. So when we have this activation, I'll draw this out in just a second, we have that activation, we're going to have a calcium influx into the cells, cells are going to swell, and we're going to get potential cell death there. So now we have hippocampal degeneration because of too much cortisol. Cortisol is act, also going to act on the hypothalamus, on the PVN nuclear, the paraventricular nuclear cells in the hypothalamus. So what can this affect? If we're going to start seeing a degradation of other uh, pituitary functions, so decreased TSH, decreased LH, so that when we start seeing those, we're going to start seeing hormone issues, we're going to start seeing uh, thyroid issues, so that's why the HPA axis is important. So the, the back to this, we have corticotrophic releasing hormone released by the hypothalamus. This is going to act on the pituitary. The pituitary secretes ACTH, or adrenocorticotrophic releasing hormone. This now acts on the adrenal glands to produce cortisol. Cortisol, again, our major stress hormone. Stress comes from uh, emotional, physical, chemical, and the, the main stressor, so number one stressor is blood sugar dysregulation. So we got to get that in check, one of our first things we have to do. So that when we have issues with blood sugar, now that's going to fire up the, the mesencephalon. Mesencephalon is our fight, flight, or freeze area. We're going to start stimulating the heck out of the, the hypothalamus to now produce more ACTH, which is going to produce more cortisol. Over time, adrenals are going to tap out. Now we get production of epinephrine, norepinephrine, as a primary line to mobilize blood sugar. So when that happens, this could be some of the hypoglycemic startle awake response there in the middle of the night because we're getting that adrenal, adrenaline being produced here. Another thing we can see, because ACTH also stimulates the adrenals to produce mineral corticoids or uh, aldosterone, we're going to see salt and mineral balance issues here. So possibly edema, possibly having to go to the restroom a lot, more so than fluid intake. Uh, we're going to see uh, mineral deficiencies potentially. But if this is left to go, I mean, the, there, there's many different axes that it, this can uh, that can impact here. So one last time, now that we have everything here, the hypothalamus releases corticotrophic releasing hormone. Hypothalamus is responsible for a lot of our autonomic function or our automatic function. This includes uh, heart rate, respiration rate, blood pressure, drive, uh, temperature control. So all of these, uh, uh, satiety, hunger, so all of these daily processes are controlled by the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus releases corticotropic releasing hormone which talks to the anterior pituitary. Anterior pituitary produces adrenocorticotrophic releasing hormone. This stimulates the adrenal glands, small glands that sit on top of the kidney, to produce cortisol. Cortisol, this works on a negative feedback mechanism. Cortisol, too much of it is going to shut down hypothalamic function. So now we start seeing heart rate issues, we start seeing respiration issues, we start seeing blood pressure issues, we start seeing temperature control issues because too much cortisol is burning out that hypothalamus. We start seeing thyroid issues with that. Also, we're losing our main check and balance in the hippocampus. So hippocampus right here will moderate hypothalamus. So clinically, what are we going to see there? Short-term memory loss, craving salt, loss of smell sensation. So some clinical pearls that we're going to add back into that. So adaptogenic herbs can help with this, but adrenal formulas, if they're not helping, we need to go higher up. And likely we're losing hippocampus hippocampal control. That's where the phosphatidylserine helps with that, but the decreasing overall inflammation can be a, a useful factor too. 
Now, I want to talk about the NMDA receptor. So, NMDA receptor is all throughout the nervous system. So, NMDA, we have N methyl D aspartate. This guy responds to glutamate. That's going to open the doors. So let's draw this receptor here really quick. Again, this is just a schematic of how that goes. So we have that. So imagine this, these big gates on every neuron. So these are spread out throughout the neuron. And then in the middle of this guy, we have magnesium. So magnesium is a very key player here to help prevent um, NMDA activation. So we have too much uh, glutamate. This is going to kick magnesium out of the way. And now we have a, a flood in, a huge influx of calcium. Now we have an ion shift. This ion shift is going to cause, so ion shift will cause swelling of the cell until, sometimes to the point where it bursts there. So this is a process that we can get under control again by magnesium and decreasing glutamate. So decreasing glutamate, MSG in our diet, decreasing aspartame, artificial sweeteners, this is going to throw off uh, um, aspartame, glutamate, those are going to throw off the ability to, to store magnesium right there in the center, and we're going to get a huge influx of calcium, we're going to get cell swelling, and eventually cell death. So we, this is the process by which the hip, we have hippocampal degeneration with too much cortisol. Also on the, the nerve cell, we have receptors for these corticosteroids. So too much cortisol now is going to open these gates, allowing calcium influx. So very, very effective treatment with this is magnesium. So magnesium is going to help plug this, plug this gate so we can't get that calcium influx. Decreasing diet with getting the crap out of your diet, MSG, uh, artificial sweeteners with aspartame, that's going to be immediately converted to, to glutamate and, and formaldehyde at, uh, at body temperature. So hopefully this helps a little bit and gives a little insight on to the NMDA receptors as well as how that plays into the HPA axis. If you have any questions, please feel free to PM me. Give me a call at 503-351-0979. As well as uh, shoot me an email, drholsey at gmail.com. Thanks again, guys.